worship uh, our God. We ask that you're able to please stand for the call to worship. Praise our God together. Saints and servants. Saints and servants, hosts of heaven, all creation, praise the name of the Lord, night and morning. Sing his glory now forevermore. Earthly kingdoms, all dominions, bow before him, praise the name of the Lord, none as holy, none as worthy, now forevermore. Crown with adoration, he is high above the nations who is like the Lord our God who is like the Lord our God our Lord Jesus our Lord Jesus for our weakness to redeem us, praise the name of the Lord in his kindness. He will keep us now and forevermore. Crown with adoration, he is high above the nations who is like the Lord our God. Raise us from the ashes, he has turned our grief to gladness, who is like the Lord our God, who is like the Lord our God.
shaper at the stars, you alone, the dweller of my heart, mighty King, how beautiful you Never 
blessing. In blessing, in sorrow, the ordinary, whatever the cause is, you're always worthy. My heart's cry, my whole life is for your glory. You have my attention.
we say with the king. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Now hear the good news of our gracious God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and righteousness, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, the acts of the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always hide, nor will he keep his anger forever. If he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the steadfast love the Lord shows his saints. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. To those those who look to Jesus for their salvation and redemption, the forgiveness of sins is given in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Praise Praise be to God. Now this is the word of God. Heavenly Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a good and gracious God, that your steadfast love and truth does endure forever. O O God, that we would be lost, but with it, in faith, Thank you for this gracious gift. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And now can we come to you in faith and in repentance. We pray, we pray now for our service. Uh, we pray that you would help uh, the Lord of Pastor Dennis to teach you with power, that the word would not come back void, but that it would uh, complete its purpose, that you would sanctify us by your truth, for your word is truth. Uh, we also pray that as we are completing our semester, uh, that the Lord send us, uh, that you help us to prepare well, that you help these poor college students who are not home or a new job elsewhere, uh, to live as um, gospel lights wherever they are, to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, uh, and that we would be able to help them so they can help us. Uh, we also pray for our uh, summer team, the students from Stockwater, and we pray for another opportunity to be able to meet with the youth, showing the people, and we thank you for your faithfulness uh, to our small church here by allowing us these opportunities to meet with the youth. So we thank you for who you are, and thank you for our time here today. Uh, as we have continued preparing ourself, um, ourselves for a time um, of, in our time of worship, in our time and corporate confession, uh, we now have an opportunity to see a tangible picture of how and why we have been forgiven. And this picture is given to us through the bread and cup, what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. It's an opportunity for us to partake in one symbolic cup and bread and as a sign of unity as the people come together. Um, we invite every baptized believer to join us this morning as we partake in this. If you are not baptized, we want to encourage you to consider baptism first before we uh, come and partake in this meal together. If you are not a follower of Jesus, we are very glad that you're here, but we do hope that you have an opportunity to uh, have your questions answered. If you have any questions about what it means to follow Christ, uh, I'd like to invite you to talk to me, Pastor Theo, or any of our deacons this morning. But today would not be a day that you uh, take the bread and cup, but it can be a day that you take hold of Christ and believe. And we'd just love for you to just observe and see why this meal is so important for uh, believers. Um, so at this moment and at this time, I'd like to invite all those who 
um, will be partaking with us this morning to line up to my left or right. And please hold on to the bread and cup as we will uh, take them together. So now and see there is perfect love and comfort in your tears. Rest here in his wondrous feet. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus satisfied. He is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. Come find what this world cannot offer. Come and find your joy here complete. Taste the living water, never thirst again. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, he is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. find your hope now in Jesus. He is all he said he would be. Grace is overflowing from the Savior's heart. Rest here in his wondrous feet. meditate on these truths that when we partake in the bread and cup we receive Christ and all of his benefits we have our faith nourished we get a foretaste of the heavenly feast that awaits us it should stir our hearts in anticipation the bread and cup is also a symbol and representation of the gruesome death of Jesus Christ nailed to the cross for the sins of many a reminder of what it took for people like us to be forgiven. So we receive this sacrament as a sign and seal of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, verse 24, it says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance. Of me. Let us remember our Lord together. Then in verse 25 and 26 says this in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we eagerly await our Lord's coming. Let's partake. May you pray with me. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we have seen this beautiful picture, this tangible example of what your son has done. So we can come before you and confess our sins. So we as a people can come before you and confess our sins with assurance of faith, knowing that you forgive us, you welcome us, you accept us. It's because of what your son has done for us. Now we can come with full confidence that when we repent and confess and come to you, we are welcomed. That there is no fear, there's no condemnation, there's no worry whether or not you will receive us. You are promised that you will. That you have always been waiting, Lord. So we thank you this morning as we take this bread and we, or we took this bread and we took this cup. That we're reminded that we're encouraged. May it stir our hearts to love and affection like we have sung. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. We are continuing our catechism, which is a question and answer method of discipleship. It gives us an opportunity to learn valuable truths of faith. And our goal, ultimately, is that our hearts would be transformed and we would grow in Christ's likeness. And so we are... In question 51 this morning in the New City Catechism, I will uh, read the question, and I'd like to invite you to recite the answer together. In question 51, beloved, says this, of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension? The answer is, Christ physically ascended on our behalf, just as he came down to earth physically on our account, and he is now advocating for us in the presence of his Father, preparing a place for us, and also sends us his spirit. Um, I won't spend too much time since all this. We have gone through many weeks in 1 Corinthians 15, but we are reminded that he physically not only descended, but also physically ascended, and his bodily resurrection reminds us that we too will have a bodily resurrection. And even more so, he advocates for us in the presence of his Father, on our behalf that we have a great advocate and he represents the new and better Adam so we can have hope in a future with him. Uh, at this time, I'd like to dismiss our children between the ages of four through nine years of, uh, four through nine for our Kiss for Christ ministry. And for the rest of us, I'd like to invite you to stand and hear the word of the Lord. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and we'll be reading from verse 1 through verse 12 this morning. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 12. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend more time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Oh, there are many, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes... See that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord, as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I'm expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I urged him, uh, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has, uh, when he has opportunity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. I'm curious, how many of you here are firstborn in your family? Oh, we got a good amount. What about, like, you're the youngest one? You're the youngest in your family. Oh, excellent. So if you're a firstborn, you probably know that you are uh, the guinea pig for your parents if you have more than one, if you have siblings. Uh, when they had you, they weren't sure what they're supposed to do 
So they tried all sorts of things with you. You're the trailblazers. And, and that also includes getting in trouble. Now, for your second born or your kind of the, the younger ones, you have an opportunity to observe all the failures of your older brother or sister. I have two younger sisters, and my youngest sister is 10 years younger than me, and she shared with me that, um, and she was always known and still known to be uh, the, the obedient child. She was the one that's the nicest, the one that uh, everyone uh, got along with. And the question was always, how are you so different than someone like me? And she said, well, growing up, I just watched what you did, and I saw what mom said, and I just did the opposite. <laughs> it's actually quite smart of her to do something like that. And so she had an opportunity to observe how I got lectured or how my other sister got lectured, and she thought to herself, don't do that. Now, we have two more sermons in the book of 1 Corinthians before we wrap up our time together. And if you recall, this is what we called a gospel light church. They were light on the gospel, so they couldn't shine the light of the gospel. And Paul, he has hit on so many big issues. And if you've been with us for the majority of the time, we've seen so many heavy issues that he addressed. What more can he possibly say? What more can we possibly learn at the end of this letter? Especially when he, he's wrapping up this letter. But as we conclude 1 Corinthians, we get to read and learn Paul's concluding remarks, and we get to see a bit of his pastoral heart of Paul. And on top of that, we get to be an outside observers of how he addresses the Corinthian church. We get to be that spiritual younger sibling to the church in Corinth. And maybe hear a little bit of what he's saying. We've kind of been able to sit in on some of his lectures. We get all of the wisdom without any of the heat. And so this morning, as Paul, this great apostle, concludes this passage, I want us to be able to see that he is concluding with really a heart of a pastor. He isn't just this super spiritual apostle that's not relatable or some sort of incredibly astute theologian professor that just teaches and you're just here to absorb his intellectual arguments, nor is he just some guy that's writing a textbook and for us, we're just supposed to read it and learn it and digest it. This apostle, he is, of course, an amazing apostle and, and he has all these spiritual concepts we should learn, that we should think deeply about our faith. I'm not saying that he isn't doing any of that. And in fact, he has given us a lot of very heavy theological things to consider. But what I want us to see this morning is Paul's motivation behind what he writes. This letter is a letter written from the founding pastor of Corinth. He has an affection for this church. This is the church he planted and a church he absolutely loves. For us, we're like that younger sibling. So we get to learn from Paul talking to Corinth as he exercises these pastoral insights. So this week and next week, we get to see Paul's pastoral hearts, how he loves and how he teaches this church. And we're going to feel a little bit like a shotgun approach because Paul is wrapping up this letter. These are concluding remarks. So it's just the last things on his mind before he wraps up this letter. Remember, this is a letter. This is not a textbook. This is him sharing some of the things he has uh, learned, sharing the, the concerns that he has, and also responding to a letter that he has received from Corinth. So it might sound very odd why he responds in such a way, but he has received a letter from Corinth, and he's responding to some of the questions that the Corinthians have. And so here we actually kind of begin, and we see that. And if you look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, Paul is responding to a very specific uh, note that the Corinthians has written to him about. And Paul gives a word on intentional generosity. This is why he said, now concerning the collection for the saints, he's switching topics, and he wants them to see, all right, I'm now trying to address an issue, a question that you have posed to me. And he says, as I directed to the church of Galatia, so you are 
to do. And what he's talking about here is that he is giving instructions on this collection that he is gathering. And what's happening is that in the church, or I would say during this time, there's this famine that was going on in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is another area that is not in this, uh, not where the, where the Corinthians are, and they are going through a famine. Jerusalem is a place that are, uh, the church there are Jewish Christians, very different than them, ethnic-wise, and, and or the ethnic uh, identity of those in Jerusalem would be, uh, uh, for them, they're the Jewish people. And here we have the Corinthians, what people call the Gentiles or the Greek. And so Paul is talking to them about a very specific collection, a very specific um, offering, you can say. And so after this long argument about all these things, he switches courses because he wants to address a question that the Corinthians had. And so what was going on is that Paul was collecting money from all these different churches to aid the Jerusalem church. And so what the Corinthians were probably doing is they are probably asking, how can we help the Jerusalem church as well? Probably heard that Paul is collecting this money. Maybe Paul had been asked them to. And he goes, okay, what, how should we do it? And Paul, he responds in a very direct and straightforward way. He's not teaching anything. Um, you know, he's not talking about tithing or offering. He's not teaching about biblical generosity. The situation at hand was a famine. There's poverty and persecution amongst the Jerusalem Christians. But he doesn't say anything about that. It's a very straightforward instruction on what the Corinthians are going to do. In fact, these instructions are the same instructions he gave to another church in another region, church in Galatia. But we get here is a glimpse of the church's pattern in just everyday life. We get a little glimpse of how when they met, they met on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And also we get a glimpse of Paul's pastoral wisdom on a biblical issue. They're asking Paul, what should we do? And he gives them just very practical advice. But to be clear, the practical, practical advice he's giving is based on a biblical issue. And behind all that is this idea that Paul understands that as Christians, they should have this radical generosity towards other believers. Here we have churches, Gentile churches nonetheless, that are gathering together to care for their Jewish brothers and sisters. This picture for us, we might not think much, but it is a really countercultural and wild picture at that time. The Gentiles and the Jewish people didn't really interact with each other. And on top of that, the church in Corinth probably didn't really even have a relationship with the Jerusalem church. Their connection was Christ, that they both, both of these churches, followed Jesus. So th their ethnicity, which should have caused divides, especially coming from different parts of the Roman Empire. But because of Christ, they rallied together to love on their Jerusalem Christians. I think that's actually something really amazing and beautiful to even see that this Corinthian church, as crazy as they have been, and if you've been with us, they have been absolutely crazy in the things they said and thought and done, but at least they're doing something right here. That there is this generosity and kinship they have with these other believers, even though they might not have a relationship, a personal relationship. But because of Christ, that transcends their ethnicity and culture, they rally to come and help this church in Jerusalem. I think for us, uh, some of the questions we can consider for ourselves is that do we think in that same way? Do we react and respond in that same type of way? Are you generous with other believers? Do you have that type of heart and affection when you see another believer in need? Are you willing to be open, open in sharing what you, have, what you have? Do we find ways, do you find ways to connect with others for the work of the ministry as well? For us, an example here, this is one of the reasons why we support the Gospel Center in Osaka. We want to take part of gospel work throughout, not just here in Berkeley, but the nations. But on top of that, if you ever considered and maybe learned a little bit about, even say for us, we're primarily a Chinese church, 
the ancestry or even the history of the Chinese people and the Japanese people. It was wrought with adversity and difficulty. And even maybe some older generations would have very particular feelings about the country of Japan and the Japanese people. But we get to take part of something really beautiful, that we get to partner with a church that we did not know, we did not have a lot of personal relationship, but, be, but because we know that they are doing gospel work and willing to spread the good news to places that we can't go ourselves, we partner with them with a radical type of generosity, a gospel generosity. And I think for us, there's much for us to learn and maybe even observe. It's like, wow, why are these Corinthians so willing to do something like that for people they did not know? And how are we able to be able to pattern that in our own lives? But what I want us to observe here is that Paul, he's not trying to convince them to be generous. He expects it. He is giving advice and insight on how to give consistently. Very practical. Verse 2, he tells them on the first day of each week, which would be a Sunday, to put aside funds and store it up. Right? I believe that this is actually done while they're gathered together. Maybe they're passing a plate or something like that. But some way they're gathering the funds together. They're putting aside it. And so, when, um, so they can collect this offering for the Jerusalem church each and every Sunday. So when Paul comes, it will be all done. This is a muscle that they're exercising, that they're going to put their mind to work, and they're going to kind of actually set an example and set some time intentionally in a plan so they can go and gather this money. It is very practical what Paul is sharing. And I think for us, some of the practical takeaways we can have as believers, we might think to ourselves, yeah, I want to be more generous. And I think for us, if we are followers of Jesus, we know not only we should be more generous, but even in our hearts, I believe that as those, for us who follow Christ, we have a heart and a desire to be generous. But Paul says that heart is great. It's good. Now let me tell you how you can put it to action. And think for us, we can learn how to build that habit and pattern of generosity. One, we have a lot of, technical, uh, like a lot of techno uh, technological tools to remind us how to give. You can literally set an alarm and every week or every month, it will go off. You can even set some sort of auto pay to give. To give automatically. There's different ways to give. And I think what's good here, and it's kind, of, it's kind of fun to see Paul be so practical. He's like, this is how you can just do it. You want a desire to be a part of what God is doing? Just do something as simple like this. Set a pattern. Set a habit. And then on top of that, we see that he says that this is a proportional to what you have. And this is what Paul means when he says that he, uh, as he may prosper uh, in verse 2. To put, aside, uh, to put aside something and store it up as he may prosper. And here when he says that, it's talking about how much people received that week. Uh, see, the, time, uh, the, the society at that time is much different than what we have uh, what, much different than ours today. And for them, they'll be paid differently each week. And it's not as consistent as we might have uh, experienced. And so Paul says, hey, if you had a great week of work and you made a lot of money, then in proportion, give according to that. If the Lord has been generous with you, then you can be generous in that. But if it's not that stellar of a week, then give according to that. To those the Lord has been generous, then be all the more generous. And if you had a harder week, we're not saying that you have to do a certain amount. Be as generous as you can be. Be as sacrificial as you are called to be. He also wants this to be done consistently for a while as well. So when Paul says, when I come, there's actually going to be the money there. There's not going to be a mass scramble, and there's not going to be pressure for people to give money. He wants this to be done well. With inten uh, uh, he wants, it to, wants this to be done intentionally and with care, not under obligation or pressure. Paul wants this to be a really special gift to the Jerusalem church that's given from the heart. I love how Gordon Fee, he kind of describes it in this way. He goes, what is significant here is the very matter of the fact way the issue is taken up. On a weekly basis, they should set money aside as the Lord has prospered them. No pressure, no gimmicks, no emotion. A need has to be met and the Corinthians were capable of playing a role in it. 
In a day of highly visible campaigns for money on every side, there is something to be said for the more consistent, purposeful approach outlined here. Perhaps it also says something about the generosity Paul expected of those who were disciples of the crucified one. In other words, we're Christians. Of course we give generously to our brothers and sisters in need. In verse 3 and 4, he talks a little bit about how the money is to be transported, and he wants the Corinthians to be a representative of this gift. He doesn't want to, uh, if he doesn't have the opportunity to go with them, he's going to write them letters of introduction, because the Jerusalem believers probably don't even know who they are. Or if possible, he does go with them, and then he can be there with them and introduce them. And we actually find out later on in Romans chapter 15, verses 25 to 33, he actually does make the trip with them to deliver this gift. I think with this passage, we can summarize it with two takeaways. I think first, the normalcy of Christian generosity and giving. It was a given that the church of Corinth would give. They even initiated it. And we see this happen in different churches, including Galatia, where Paul gives the same advice to them about how to set aside funds. This should not be something that is out of the norm, um, but, or this should not be something that's um, included in the tithe. This was an extra offering. And I think for us, we want to be people that consider these things as well. How can we give to missionaries? How can we care for those inside and outside the church? How is it part of our worship? And how, how can we tangibly declare that all we have is the Lord and that we depend on him? So whether you are a student with very little or parents, we have expenses left and right because children are expensive. Or maybe you're an empty nester and you're on the verge of retirement. Whatever it looks like, what would it look like for us as believers to make it a habit to figure out how we can be all the more generous with what the Lord has given us? The second is just a well thought out plan. Whether it's putting it into your budget or just say, you know what, I'm going to deny myself this one Boba, I'm going to take that $7 and offer it that week. Or setting up automatic giving or whatever it is. How do we carve out a part of our finances as something untouchable so we can exercise this type of generosity? There are ways we can do to, do, there's many things we can do to be intentional about this. And part of growing in this is being intentional. Whether automatically doing it, setting alarms, or whatever it may be. It is important for us. But after addressing this point, Paul moves on to his travel plans. Okay, that's kind of cool, right? Where he shows actually his pastoral care in his travel plans. In verse 5, he says this. He goes, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now, just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a, wide, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. At first glance, verses 5 through 9 might look nothing more like Paul sharing his travel plans to the Corinthians. But it's actually quite a bit of tension between the Corinthians and Paul. And in fact, fast forward, I'm just going to give you a glimpse of what actually happened. So Paul, he's saying here, hey, I, I don't want to... Uh, I want to come later. I want to set some time to intentionally be with you. I don't want to come through in passing. And so I'll be there in a little bit, but not right now. Uh, plans actually reversed for Paul in the, uh, as we kind of fast forward. And Paul actually ends up showing up much earlier than anticipated. And we find out that this visit was a painful visit. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 tells us that it was not a pleasant visit when Paul came to visit them. The Corinthians and Paul, they definitely had, a, there was a lot of tension between them, a lot of conflict, and we've already kind of seen that a little bit in 1 Corinthians as well, with the different groups of people that, you know, they were for, they were for um, Peter, or they are for Apollos, some were with Paul, and there was just this, the way they saw Paul, they thought of him as weak, they thought of him as, you know, just someone that was not worthy for them, I guess. And here, we see that Paul, knowing all of this, knowing that he isn't having a hard time connecting with the Corinthians, and then even 
fast forward later on, we know that it actually came to fruition. It was a very uncomfortable visit, a painful visit. Knowing all this, Paul still pursues after them. He was having a hard time already with them. Yet he wants to go and visit them. He wants to spend time with them. He doesn't want to just come in passing. He actually wants to settle there for a while. And in a society right now for us today, where we tell each other that you should cut out the toxic person, right? Avoid the people who take away your peace. You put self-care above all else. Paul does the complete opposite. He loves and care, his love and care for the Corinthians completely outweighs the unease and the awkwardness that he has with them. Knowing all this, you can tell that Paul is working hard at being gentle. He's not trying to impose his plans on them unnecessarily. He's saying, perhaps I'll stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. This is really fascinating because this is a gentle invitation that Paul gives to invite them to be part of his mission work. Because if you recall earlier in the letter, he said, I have not taken a cent from you, so you can't say that I'm trying to like make money off of you or, or you know, that I'm benefiting from you, that he was actually working his way, so he didn't take money from them, and he didn't want their support. But here he's almost like inviting them, as I'm continuing my, in my missionary work, I do want you to be part of it if you so choose. He's trying to build the bridge, and he wants them to know that he cares. He doesn't want them to think that he's like, oh, forget about you. Oh, yeah, you're too much of a hassle. You're just, you're just too off. I, I don't want to spend that much time. I'll come by real quick. I'll stop by to say hello, but I'm going to keep on moving. He's like, no, I'm actually willing to do that. You see his pastoral heart for a really difficult congregation. This past week, my old English pastor came to mind. Uh, it wasn't because of this passage. It's just a random just randomly he came to mind. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, but I was reminded of my time growing up, when I was in middle school, when I was in high school, growing up the church, growing up in that church that I grew up, how he called out time with me. He, he met with me. He took me out to meals. And he sp- spent time with this kid. And I, I didn't think much of it at that age. But just the Lord brought it to my mind of how even though I didn't understand it at the moment, moment, that maybe I even took advantage of it at the moment, that I was given this great gift and a great pastor with a great heart to care for this young kid. And I think as we look at Paul kind of exercise his pastoral heart, uh, there's a couple of ways that we can respond as well. First, I think it's worthwhile to consider some of the pastors in your own life that might have poured into your life, right? They poured out time and care. And maybe this week, um, expressing some appreciation for what that pastor has done. Now, trust me, this is not a passive-aggressive way of me telling you to appreciate me, all right? Uh, In fact, I want to share a little bit. Last week, I received a card. Apparently, it was Minister Appreciation Day, and I didn't even know that they existed, but I received this card and in it, there was just so many just really heartfelt notes in there. I was greatly encouraged by what um, the members here has uh, written in that note. And I read every single one of them, and I was just really encouraged by that. So with that, I think there's probably a lot of pastors out there that can receive the same love and encouragement that I received from you this past week. I also think it's really important for our own souls uh, it's easy for all, maybe some of us to be critical. We're really good at giving feedback, but maybe not as good as giving encouragement. And I would say that I'm probably in that same category as well. It's easy to find the faults and flaws. It's really hard to kind of see all the good things that are going on. And maybe you just learn to acknowledge care that you have received. I think that's a wonderful way to respond. Maybe sending a letter or an email or a phone call, whatever it is. Maybe your old youth pastor or a pastor that you grew, uh, you know, pastor from uh, your old church or whatever it may be. But second, I think the question for us is how can we Im- imitate this type of care for other brothers and sisters in Christ at our church? Look, 
I'm not ignorant of the fact that when people get together, conflict and hurt inevitably follows. One of my pastors would say, uh, used to say this about the church. We're like a group of porcupines. Eventually, we're going to poke one another the closer we get. I go, that's actually a great picture. It does happen. And instead of avoiding one another or trying to brush it under the rug, what if we dove in with love and care, like just head first? Like, yeah, I get it, right? Like, we're going to get close to each other. We're going to hurt each other. But we are one family in Christ. We're going to love each other and care for each other no matter what. What would it like for you to be that Paul, to minister and love those who you might be having a difficult time with right now? Right? I, I, I am learning this as well. Like, I'm really grateful for Paul's example because it's like he's a pastor and he's doing all these things. And a lot of times it's easy for all of us to just like, well, there's some people that are just like really hard. And that's great. Like, I'm going to love you, but he puts in maximum effort. How can we put in that type of effort? Before we move on, I do want to kind of make a brief note about Paul's confidence and reliance on God's plans as well. He says he wants to visit them. He says, if the Lord permits. I don't think this is a throwaway word or a throwaway phrase. It's not us going like, you know, oh yeah, the Lord wills. But I think he really means it. And I think there's a, something we can think about how we live our life, right? Not to grab our futures too tightly. But to live in a way that reflects, like, if the Lord permits, if the Lord wills. Also in verse 8, we see that sometimes gospel opportunity comes with adversity. Just because there's adversity doesn't mean there's oppor- there is an opportunity. I think there's wise for us to keep that in mind as well. But let's keep on moving. After sharing his plans, he now wants to prepare the Corinthians to welcome Timothy. And he's actually challenged them to repentance and gospel hospitality. In verse 10 and in verse 11. So Paul here reminds them that Timothy will be visiting them. And this letter is intended to r- arrive before Timothy himself arrives. He's preparing them for how to receive him. And Paul has already told the Corinthians that Timothy will be coming. In verse Uh, In chapter 4, verse 17 through 21, he already said this, and why he was coming. Timothy was supposed to be a representative of Paul. He is an extension of Paul's authority, specifically in the area where Paul has rebuked them. And so Timothy is coming after Paul has written this letter, how they need to repent and change. He goes, by the way, Timothy is going to come. Receive him well. Well, Timothy's arrival to this church would be filled with awkwardness and tension if they do not repent. And this is Paul encouraging them to repent. And there's actually accountability that's coming. Timothy's going to come here to keep you accountable in this regard. And a tangible sign of repentance for this church would be to receive Timothy with hospitality. How they treat Timothy would show if they truly repented. Is Timothy going to come as a bearer of bad news? Like, oh my gosh, is that Tim? He's just, he's just one of Paul's lackeys. It's like, oh, annoying. Or is he going to be a representative of the hope that Paul has preached? And there's a couple of applications I want us to consider this morning. First, I think the challenge to repent is embedded in the call to salvation. For all of us here, the call is always to repent. And repentance means that a changing of mind, turning away. See, the gospel, or the good news of Jesus, tells us that we are all rebels. We need to actually change our direction, that we need to actually move away from our rebellion and move towards Christ. Christ came to forgive sins. He came to give his life. He lived the life we could not live and died the death that we deserved, rose again on the third day, So for all those who repent, turn from their ways and turn towards Christ by faith, will be saved, will be forgiven. This is the news that every believer has received. When we turn away from our sins and turn towards Christ by faith, it changes how we see ourselves, it changes how we see Christ, and it changes how we see Christ's people. And second, even as believers... We do sin and we stray from time to time. We might go, yeah, I I understand. I've I've turned from my sin. I know I need to receive Christ in this way. We know that the call to repentance for all of us is something that we've responded to. But we do sin and we stray from time to time. And there will be times 
that your brother or your sister, out of love for you, would call your sin out. They are going to take, and we've always encouraged this at this church, right? we always encourage members here to speak hard words in lives of people. And we've always, and we've promised each other that we'll not only speak hard words, but we'll receive them with grace and we'll receive them in humility. And you're going to have brothers and sisters that are going to take a relational risk because they care about your soul. They're going to take a relational risk for the sake of your spiritual health. And yes, in this particular passage, we're going to see that this is a direct result of the, the direct result of repentance would be hospitality and welcoming Timothy. I think for us, with repentance for us, also comes with hospitality as well. If people are willing to take relational risks in calling out your sins, our repentance should come with welcoming. And for us, for those who've taken that relational risk, I think oftentimes we're like, okay, I know what I need to do. I say it. And then you leave. I'm like, I don't want to interact with that person ever again. I did my job. How do we welcome those who are repented back in? How can we be like this Timothy who's walking into essentially like a den of vipers, not knowing like, are you going to bite me or not? But he's taking that risk. How can we, one, be the type of people, knowing that, hey, I need, I have blind spots, and I need people to tell me that I have blind spots. And to not hold those things against them, but to thank them, to welcome them in hospitality and love. And then Paul, he, this is Paul just kind of like jotting down the last things on his mind before he wraps this up. So he's writing, the like, okay, you talked about, he's like looking at the letter. You, you, you've asked about how to give, and he starts talking about that, right? And as he's writing about the giving, he's like, oh, you know what, I, I want to remind you again, Timothy's coming, and he writes that down, right? And he's like, oh, I want, I want to remind you of this, I want to remind you of that, and here, in verse 12, he addresses one last issue. And he says again, now concerning. So there's a chance that the Corinthians actually wrote this down and asked Paul about this. Now concerning our brother Apollos, since I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. And that's it. He leaves it there. But I want to get a little bit more back on what's going on here. It is very possible that in the Corinthian letter, he, they asked Paul to send Apollos. Or perhaps maybe a mention their affection or preference for Apollos. And we know this. It's not far fresh to believe that the Corinthians really liked Apollos. Even more so than Paul. Perhaps it was probably uh, his preaching style. Acts 18 verse 25 said that he was an eloquent man, competent in scripture. And Paul addresses Apollos uh, and his faction in verse one, uh, chapter 1 verse 12 and chapter 3 verse 4 through 9. Now, if Paul was territorial or even insecure in his standing in the church of Corinth, he probably would not want to have Apollos anywhere nearby his church. He's the founding pastor, after all. He planted this church. Imagine a pastor asking another pastor who is known and well-received in the church not to come around. Paul would have done this if he felt insecure. But that's not Paul. He did not care about his personal ministry, per se. He didn't care about his influence. Only about the Lord's. That's all he cared about. What the Lord was doing and what the Lord called him to do. So in response to this church, who showed nothing but disrespect to Paul, which must have been really discouraging, as the person who's labored years at this church, Paul says he asked, not only asked, but strongly urged Apollos to come and visit this church. Paul was not just trying to check a box. Like, I, I, you asked, so I asked. Check, done. But he strongly requested Apollos to visit. This type of humility is easily overlooked in this passage. But it's amazing. Paul sees Apollos on the same team as him. They're united in gospel work. This isn't about rivalry. This isn't about glory. This is about making Christ known. And this is not new to Paul. 
Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verse 15 through 18, that he proclaimed uh, that there are those who proclaim Christ and preach Christ in envy or rivalry or selfish ambition. And Paul says, doesn't matter. Christ is proclaimed, so he rejoices. And to be clear, he's not talking about Apollos in Philippians. He's one of those guys. In fact, what is surprising is there's no greeting from Apollos. There's no, Paul, uh, Apollos does not send his greetings or anything of that sort. And some theologians speculate that Apollos didn't do that because he probably did not want and he probably did not appreciate how he is being used to split up this church. Apollos probably did not want to come because he didn't want to make it even worse. So he just actually doesn't even give a greeting. And Paul, on top of that, lets them down really easy. He lets the Corinthians down really easy. He ends it very vaguely. He says, you know, I really told, I urged Apollos to come, but he goes, it was not his will to come now, and goes, he will come when he has an opportunity. This is being let down very easy. But even that, right, Paul is being so gracious with this church. He tells them, you know, he'll try to come, he was nothing intentional, nothing specific, very intentionally vague. I think for us, as we read this and think about it, it's imperative for us to not see other believers as rivals or opponents. We are not in competition with other churches in Berkeley. Every gospel-preaching, Christ-exalting church here in this area is a church we pray for, a church we love on, and a church that we partner for the sake of Christ. This is not about us. It is about Jesus. And if the Lord uses us in a specific way, then great. And if the Lord uses another church in a specific way, even better. Also, this is not a pastoral beauty contest over here. Pastor Theo and myself, we have one aim. It is to preach Christ, make him known, love you well. And I will be more than happy to invite guest preachers who are better than me, who edify you well. And if we have guest preachers here and they're like, wow, this guy is so much better than Pastor Dennis or this guy is so much better than Pastor Theo, we're probably like, great. We don't care. It's not about us. We're united in gospel work. It should never be that it's me versus someone else. We're not in competition. We strive for humility in Christ and advancement of the gospel. So let's be careful, listener, to what Paul is saying to this church. There's a lot to glean here, and it seems like it's a very shotgun approach. But I think as we dig in, there's a lot that we can learn. There's a lot of wisdom here. We see Paul as a pastor in action. We get a glimpse of his heart. So let's be encouraged by his humility and his example that we can follow. So whether it's in areas of generosity or care, repentance, hospitality, or gospel unity, let us embody all of that so God can get all the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us 1 Corinthians that we get to read this letter written to our um, big uh, brother church from many years ago. I pray we as a church would learn and grow from what, um, this, what Apostle Paul has written for us or written for them that we can receive as well. I call this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Would you, would you stand with me in response as we sing? Run 
try I'm the branch and you are the vine Draw me close and teach me to abide Where the Spirit leads Where the Spirit leads As I'm following I do Um, please, please do 
you can find out for that if you haven't already. And she researches the Google Alpha Bias to help you do so. Uh, please stand for uh, to receive the benediction. Uh, please bow with me. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority for all time and now forever. Amen. Very thankful that you um, have worshipped with us this, uh, this week. Have a very blessed week. Bye. Love you.